This is RCCast, and our special guest today is Baba Nakaban. Okay. Well, let's start. <laughs> morning. Yeah, we started. Good morning, Dad. Good morning, Sigalela. <laughs> um, we are live in your apartment and your art studio in Atlanta, Georgia. And the first question that I ask everybody on this podcast that we begin with is, what's your favorite color? So let's start there. Depends on my mood, depends on the day. But the runner-ups usually electric blue, imperial yellow, lately magenta, hmm. or a roast tomato red. Hmm. How, Alizarin red. What, how, red at, so. at what point does a color enter the new list of favorite colors? And how recently is magenta or... Magenta is new. Is like pretty new, uh, year and a half, two years. What was the, was there? Is there an occasion that that clocked it, or just mood change, or what? I think I was painting with something using magenta, and it just kind of it's such a strong color. <laughs> I love it. Um, what what what? Mood but but it kind of wears out. Yeah. But it has no texture. Huh. It's uh, there's no subtlety. See. What do you think? What what mood does magenta evoke? Bravery. Huh. Like fuchsia, defiance. Like fuchsia? Insolence. Hmm. It, it's kind of, yeah, it's like fuchsia, but fuchsia is, has more purple in it. Mm -hmm. Magenta is like, it is it. So it's like yeah. a strong and you know, dominant color, surprisingly. No. So I like that. So the other colors, electric blue and imperial yellow, are those because you, you, you also assign certain moods to them or because they, you... They, they, they're fleeting. Both of them are fleeting. Imperial yellow could be egg yolk, could be saffron. So this kind of fine line that is just perfect. Electric blue, the same thing. It could be cyan, it could be azure, but mm -hmm. it's kind of a fleeting moment where it's just that particular shade. Wow. I like that. Do you have you ever, are there specific paintings that you've used those colors that you know of? Or can can those colors be used in a painting or if they're fleeting? Sure they can, but uh, you, you can't find a paint to, to, to duplicate it. Hmm. Which is uh, uh, quinacridone red or quinacridone orange comes closer to that tomato, the roast tomato that I was talking about. Uh, there are some nice, beautiful uh, yellow, the Indian yellow or Indian something, I forget. It's kind of orange yellow, but it's not quite imperial yellow. It has too much orange in it. Did you always have such a knack for naming colors, or was it not, was it until you started painting that you sort of? No, I always did. I always did. did. Yeah. Growing up, or or it's just, it's just just in general, it's like always like you know, blue is you know, is like it's a it's a human. Or, or what are you talking about? You know, is it a man? Is it a woman? Is it a good person? Is it a horrible person? Is it a I mean, I'm a jovial person. Is it a depressed person? You don't know what it is. Just a human. So you have to define the shades. And, and that, is that with, yeah. with, with, do you start with the primary colors? Like the, because no. the, the analogy that I like to use is like going from like the eight color Crayola box to the 256 no, color. For, no, for me, it, it's a, uh, each family of color is like a different, literally a different human, different creation. You don't say, I like yellow better than I like blue. But you can say, I like, you know, uh, azure better than I like uh, midnight blue. Right. So it's, it's like, you know, within that. Just like you can say, you know, I like this person better than that dog. Among dogs, there could be better dogs and not as good as dogs. And among women, people, people the same thing. But you can't say this person is just like a dog butt. So you, 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 you don't accept the, the categorization of a color called blue-green? Um, it's elementary, it's third grade. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, you, you once told me, that I never forgot this, which is that colors are to painting what spices are to cooking. Yeah, and words are to writing. And words are to writing, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So how, as, as one is learning more about do you believe that the more colors you know about that you experiment with, the more you can create? It's funny. It's uh, it's sort of you, you tend to gravitate towards kind of you know your favorite things. Most of my paintings end up being 
sort of tea, cognac color tone. Yeah. And I like that. I don't know why it does. Uh, mm-hmm. I just like using transparent color, like quinacridones. Quinacri- and they tend to come in more, you know, kind of orange tea, cognac, you know, the crimson, but transparent color. I like that. I'm, it's sort of like, you know, like a person. You, some people like blondes. Mm-hmm. So they get gravitated towards blondes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, and, you know, the, you, I can acknowledge that there's, you know, beauty, or the people who like blondes, I'm not necessarily one of them, but uh, you, they acknowledge that, you know, a brunette can be very, very beautiful, but they kind of like the blondes. It's the same thing for me. Look at all my paintings have this yellowish kind of, you know, uh, yeah. uh, crimson tone, or either, either highlighted in it or the background is that color. So, mm. That's what I like. You imagine, you know, yeah, I gotta you know, turn this. Like blonde, blonde girlfriend. And sometimes it's like blonde, 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 Hitchcock blonde. Sometimes it's like, you know, Hitchcock blonde. blonde. What is Hitchcock blonde? You don't know Hitchcock blonde? Is that a color? Or oh, that is a color. Person? I think it's like, like L'Oreal makes a Hitchcock blonde. Very, very light blonde in all the Hitchcock movies. Mm. Kim Novak, uh, Grace Kelly. Uh, oh, what's, wow. the, what's the name? The, ha, 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 what was her name? Mother of uh, Melina Griffith. Tippy Hedren. Okay. She, oh, he always had that color hair. Very, very ultra blonde. From Psycho? Well, Psycho was black and white. No. Uh, Psycho was blonde, but it wasn't that. Right, you could From, tell. she's uh, 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 Vertigo. Of course. Perfect. Right, 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 right. Wow. So, so within your... Um, I, but I would also imagine maybe because you did portraits for so long that the, the a lot of the, the flesh color that you use for portraits is probably within that family as well. And also, what, is, what yeah. does quinacridone mean? Quinacridone is a, I think it's a chemical. Um, in paint, there's like, you know, uh, uh, there's different chemicals that kind of make up paint. There's one, I forget the name now. Um, it's pretty... It's very intense, very opaque. They make yellow and red nice illegal. Quinacridone is very transparent. Mm-hmm. Usually it comes in this family of red from, you know, sort of quinacridone uh, crimson, quinacridone orange, quinacridone light red. And they're all kind of in the same family of uh, uh, reddish, brownish, orangish tones. Mm. I, like, I like the transparent. I like the, the kind of... I don't like solid colors. I mean, you kind of too much. You, you're married to that. So, obviously, in the in the seventeen years that you've been painting, fifteen, seventeen, 15, going on nineteen, nineteen, eighteen years. and a half. Yeah, you've obviously acquired a lot of different colors from a lot of different yeah paints, paint varieties and oil paintings and acrylic paintings. Yeah. So, would you say that you're do, 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 like those, those golden, for example, or Utrecht, do they yeah. come out with new colors? or have you Not sort of really. Yeah. No, it's very, on occasion, they do. And sometimes they last, sometimes they don't. But no, it's basically, you know, age-old names of colors. that are, Right. Yeah. Cad, cadmium. I was thinking about the red. Cadmium, red, cadmium, cadmium red. yellow. Very opaque. Right. And, and, and sort of Van Dyke brown. brown. Van Dyke brown is, uh, yeah, that's a shade. Very, very dark brown. <laughs> this. Right, right, right. So, so, how do you take inventory of what paints and colors you have and what you'll need more of? Uh, usually, there's certain colors that you know, run, run out of very fast. You know, there's titanium white that goes like this, and I buy it in big tubes and you know, keep having to repeat that. Then, uh, like uh, uh, sienna, raw sienna, uh, burnt sienna, uh, umbers, and things like that, those are kind of stock of the trade mm-hmm. and I go through those a lot and then but like the bigger pain is when it wants to be colorful I kind of dabble in whatever I get my hands on right but I tend to gravitate towards either that aqua blue mm. or the kind of tea cognac brownish red mm. those are kind of the two favorites right and do you always know what colors you'll be using for any given painting or do you do you like, pretty much, pretty yeah. much. And then I experiment. With it. I try, for example, the green, tough color. Uh, it could be too 
olive or it could be too grayish mm. or it could be too yellow or sometimes too blue. It's a tough, tough color to, to work with. Uh, I'm, the, but one, one time at least I knew specifically what I wanted and it was a... Uh, uh, what was it? Some red, God, what is it? Vermilion red. Mm. $57 for a tube this big oil wow. painting, vermilion red. Wow. Hard to find, expensive. Usually paints are like, you know, seven, eight, nine dollars. Um, and I used it for a dab, literally, this big, <laughs> once. Do you still have it? I still have the rest of the tube, <laughs> once. And that was for that painting over there, the, the, one of my first paintings. Oh, wow. But I had to have that particular shade of you. How, uh, how do you, and, and you would never mix that with another color, I guess, at that point. That's like sort of, you know, mixing champ vintage champagne with, you know, Perrier. Right. <laughs> you just don't do that. <laughs> right. So is there a, so, the, so is there a hierarchy, obviously, of paint qualities that you're fine mixing? But I find out some people don't, do, 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 Jim. Don't care as long as it's paint. You usually get the cheapest stuff by the large quantity. Sheila is one of them. My friend, uh, she's, uh, Yasha, is, is one of them. He just gets a lot of color because his paintings are very rich, very kind of layered and very thickly put. So it just kind of goes crazy with putting the, the, the colors on. And it's beautiful. Um, I have found that there is a distinct difference in the quality of paint, mm. quality and consistency of paint. For example, in oil paint, um, Old Holland makes by far the best mm. in terms of consistency, longevity, uh, steadfast, what is it called, light fastness of the color. I have a tube that I probably haven't opened in, in the 12 years or so. If it's oil, oil, Old Holland, it just pours out like the day, first day. Other brands, either a lot of oil will come out or it's caked in already, too dry. Mm. So it's a, uh, it just lasts longer. It's more reliable. It's more consistent, and the and the colors are exactly the same every time. Mm. And then the colors are the same paint. Like you you talked about the uh, Van Dyke brown completely changes color if you buy it with a, uh, a golden brand or a Winsor Newton or you know Glidden or whatever. Completely changes. One of them is too red. One of them is too you know kind of you know grayish. Thing. Hmm. One of them is a deeper brown, um, so it's yeah. I, have, I, I am brand conscious when wow. it comes to paint, consistent. But at a certain point, isn't there like an objective hue number for Van Dyke brown that they should adhere to? Not for Van Dyke brown. For other ones, for like a burnt umber, raw umber, right. things like that, titanium white, the basics. Yeah, there is pretty consistent. Even then, different manufacturers are slightly different. But in the case of Van Dyke Brown, it's drastic difference. Mm. Yeah. Wow. And so, so when it comes to assembling the composition for a painting, because you, 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 you've done different kinds of paintings, mm. from portraits to abstracts to yeah. different kinds of figurative stuff and different textures and all that. It goes, and, and multimedia stuff, you know, it's not... A lot of your paintings don't just use paints, but they use... Yeah, I incorporate you know, like whatever I get my hands on. Exactly, different yeah. materials. So as you assemble your supplies for a painting, how how prepare, how much do you prepare um, all those materials in advance? Like, do you know, for, first off, obviously, for portraits, you would always do oil. Usually. Usually Sometimes oil. I do the background in acrylic. And then the face and, you know, whatever, the place yeah. that you need to shade with oil. Like that last one with the glitters. Yeah. You know, and I kind of did that in, I think I used the uh, acrylic because it dries fast. I could put the glue on yeah. quicker. And then but then, you know, I did the, oil for the details face. of the face and the hands mm -hmm. or whatever with oil. So as you're assembling, basically, I guess, I guess I'm asking how much preparation do you do beforehand for any given piece? I usually know more or less what I want. Mm-hmm. And like for example, in the case of portraits, I take I take maybe fifty to hundred, sometimes two hundred pictures of the subject, and um, then on the computer I kind of cut and paste. You know, I like the hand position in one picture, but then the neck position in another picture, so I kind of splice it in and this and that. So I kind of play with that. And once I get, I do the composition on the computer. Mm -hmm. Once I've done that, I already know 
what material is going to go where. For example, in the case of that, uh, uh, that, that glitter thing, I didn't know that I was going to use limestone and glitter and whatever. So I went to this, uh, you know, the craft store, just a shitload of glitter and whatever I, you know, I, I thought would be right for the painting. Um, and then I've sort of figured out the suitability of how to approach. Hmm. Like in the case of that painting, I did the glitter and the acrylic part first. I mean, I outlined the face or whatever, but then the details of the face was the last thing I did. Hmm. But then, like, you know, once that was finished and dry, I would go back and, you know, work on the, you know, the, the details of the clothes and the whatever, the, whatever, the necklaces and, you know, whatever, bracelets and rings and stuff like that. Um, so it goes back and forth. But I usually know what I want. Yeah. How do you know when you want to start a new painting? It comes to me. It's like hunger. Mm. How do you know when you want food? Mm. I get Literally, hungry. I, didn't. Huh? <laughs> I get hungry. Yeah, that's the thing. It gnaws at me until I start to start it. Does it come in the form of a of a picture or an idea or idea? Uh huh. Idea. How to in, in specifically in, in in what sense? Masalan, this big painting, the the square one with the foot. Mm -hmm. I had this idea way in the beginning, eighteen eighteen years ago, seventeen years ago. And uh, I knew that I wanted the foot. I knew that I wanted the idea of the uh, uh, baptism, display baptism. But at the time, I didn't have the technique to do it. Mm. I didn't know how I could depict water. I could depict it. But so the idea kind of was retained for like 17 years mm. until, you know, basically these two friends of mine say, hey, you, know, we, you want to paint us? We're available. Okay, you be Jesus, you be, you know... John and you know whatever we do the painting and then and, and then I asked another friend of mine to be the harlot from hell so it kind of <laughs> all got put together much later you know right. idea 17 years ago execution last year yeah so you knew at that so you always sort of are conscious of what skills you would need to accomplish a certain idea or oh, uh, what kind of, at least what uh, I was lacking uh-huh not necessarily needing, but I was lacking. For example, the transparency of, of water. Now I've worked with uh, uh, resin a lot, mm -hmm. and that's a perfect way of depicting water. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that is, I think I put too much, too much paint in that. I would have done it more clear now, but uh, it, it works. It, it's kind of, it, it depicts water very successfully. Yeah. But I didn't know that when I first started. Does that... Um does that process also translate, carry forward into when you want to depict a series of paintings? Or does, does each painting still come individually? Or do you envision a no. set of paintings in a certain No, I have done, I've done both. Yeah. There's one of a kind paintings and there's like, you know, repeat theme paintings. Like the, the Ben series is, you know, repeat. And I knew that, that from the beginning. I was yeah. going to do a lot of the same idea. Mm. Um, but then like, it's, it's, uh, things like this even, even though it has a, the, um, the Ben picture in it is one of a kind. I cannot do that again. I don't even know how I did it. Yeah, yeah. I suppose that's 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 my next question. Is you you've said also that that the painting tells you when it's finished. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. And so does that? Do you find that? But you've also you've also gone back years later and altered some paintings. No. Hmm. no. I don't recall that I ever have. There's some paintings that I made, like for example, that, le that foot. I had started, but then I painted over it. Yeah. So technically, I went back to it. Yeah. But by the time I came back to it, it was kind of the idea was far more developed than, mm. than at first. And the technique was, was built. And then the, the idea, like all those insects and stuff like that, and felt comfortable using. Mm. So uh, it, it wasn't like, you know, I went back and said, oh, gee, I could improve upon this. The first try was kind of insufficient skill and confidence. And then 16 years later, okay, I have the skill and I sure have, sure that I have the confidence to do it. Yeah. So it's, that's the reason. Because it is imperfect, no. I have redone several paintings, but not to improve it. Just mm -hmm. I didn't like the subject, but I needed the canvas. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to pay $70, $80 for canvas. I had 12 of them. Uh, so I kind of painted over and read it the same thing. Those, those, uh, that series of 12 used to be a completely different painting. Didn't like it, painted over it, mm. and then did this uh, 
resin thing on it. Um, you've also, before you even started painting yourself, you had a long, long time of, of appreciating art and artists yourself, academically or just in person. You were, yeah. you, you always appreciated the great artists and their paintings before you were an art, yeah. Yeah. avid art person. It, 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 it's, I'm, I'm still going to, I don't know if it's adequate, adequately is the right word or not, but I was somewhat, you know, familiar with art and you know, yeah. art history and different movements and different types of art and styles of art. Uh, funny enough, I was, uh, I was always good at uh, art in, in school, in high school. And I remember one time uh, in between classes, I had to produce a painting this big for the art class. And uh, I hadn't done it. So in the five minutes before the break, I used gouache, which dries very fast. Painted half of it gold, half of it yeah, orange. So the teacher came in and said, what is that? I said, this is sunset in the desert. <laughs> he loved it. He gave me an A. Yeah. So I kind of had a knack for art, but I never really did any art. Yeah. I, I used to do uh, uh, pencil portraits mm. in like seventh, eighth grade. Reasonably successful. I, really, I haven't looked at it in a long time. I've now look at it probably really bad. But I kind of liked it. But then I kind of they never really enjoyed and Another kind of good, good thing in high school, or kind of success in art in high school, there was this guy that you kind of, you know, had this favorite group of students, his art teacher. I was not one of them. But one day I sort of just kind of scribbled this, you know, the painting of a kind of a river and uh, trees and whatever, landscape. And did it all with different shades of green. And he loved it. I kind of made myself known to this otherwise dismissive <laughs> teacher. So wow. I enjoyed it, but I never really paid attention to it. Mainly because both my sisters were painters, and I always thought that it was their domain, and they should always know, and they already did know, at least Roy does know a lot about painting, and you know, yeah. I don't think I could ever reach, reach that level of meticulousness. Mm. But I'm bold, more bold than she is. Mm. So that came in later when I started, and you know, kind of, the boldness, one of the most important ingredients of, 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 of painting is confidence. Mm. You either gain it or you fake it. <laughs> right. So over the years, you know, I, I, I'm more confident in it. I'm far more daring than I was when I first started. Yeah. But even, even at first, I always experimented with different things. Uh, yeah. with different, like you know, putting fabric on the, on the couch, for example, and that. Uh, soldier painting on that mm -hmm. medal. Um, and that kind of grew into sort of my own style where I put, you know, different things. I put coins, I put dead insects, I put chains, I put, you know, body bags, whatever on, on a painting. That's kind of audacity, not even confidence. Right. But it helped me. Yeah. It kind of it helped me in a spiritual way where, where I was able to express myself defiantly without worrying about whether it's good or bad or mediocre or you know, <laughs> acceptable or not. Yeah. So in that sense, it was very productive. Were there artists, whether through your in contemporary modern art or in, in, in ancient or, or, or Renaissance arts that you, you always aspire towards artists, or compared to? Th there's some that I like, uh, you know, obviously, you know, some, some masters. I love uh, uh, Caravaggio, for example. Uh, I like Leonardo, except for Mona Lisa. Um, there's, there's, I love Goya, uh, Dali, for example. But there's some, there's few pieces of art that have found a place in my heart that I cannot extract them from. What are those? One of them is uh, the Dying Slave, Michelangelo's Dying Slave. Okay. Another one is uh, the Raft of the Medusa. Are there, and they're they're both at the at the Louvre. At the Louvre. Yeah. yeah, I weep in front of them. Yeah, weep in front of them. I just said talking about it makes me emotional. <laughs> Another one is Goya's, you know, whatever it's called, the the, maxim, the assassination or whatever oh. execution. Of my, she's like this in front of the barrels. Yeah, and the, the last one is she's Ruby Ridges. <laughs> Oh, oh, the Norman, Norman Rockwell, Rockwell yeah. Ruby Bridges. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> and the Guernica. 
I've, I've seen Gerdica yeah. in person. Too. These things have poked through my heart <laughs> and nested there for a long time. Wow. There's other beautiful paintings, but a little bit they scratch the surface, but not really going. Wow. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and the Sistine Chapel maybe being one? Oh. <laughs> Oh my God, the, 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 this, that's a different experience because it is not looking at art and appreciating the craftsmanship of the art. That is like literally is peeking through the presence of the divine. It's like feeling the essence of divinity. Hmm. Nothing in the world like it. It doesn't matter that it is painted well or not so good or whatever. Or, the subjects are interesting, but uh, the spirit that that evokes is nothing like it in the world. Nothing like it in the world. Um, you did mention that you, you you're not a fan of the Mona Lisa, but I want to know exactly no. exactly why. Maybe, uh, because maybe in, in the Louvre, for example, where Mona Lisa is, outside of it is that long gallery, magnificent paintings, including five or six by Leonardo that are infinitely better than the Mona Lisa. That Madonna and Child, for example, with the Madonna of the Rocks or something like that. It's magnificent because of hand like this. Uh, and then when you're walking through it, at first there's kind of no, nobody there. You can look at this. And then you know, there's kind of, a, it's like a river, like a uh, whatever, white water thing. The water goes fastly. The people can run fastly. And they all sh gather in front of Mona Lisa. Why? I don't know. So it demands, do you think it's worth it or not? And my unqualified answer is, no, it's not. Mm. But I acknowledge that it's a, it is a brand thing. Yeah. You know, it's a and, uh, sheep like brands. <laughs> well, then thinking, thinking back, to, back to, you know, someone like Michelangelo, for example, how do you go about explaining what, what an accomplishment it is to have done the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo David. is different from almost anybody. David. Yeah. Such as David. Yeah. It is alive. Mm. It has soul. You can, it's, you can feel the presence of a live being in that huge, gigantic statue. Nobody else does that. There's beautiful statues by Canova, by, by, by Bernini, whatever. None of them like Michelangelo. He injects this life force into his work. Is that, is that how, how, how does one accomplish that? Gift. It is a gift. Nobody can accomplish that. It's and a gift by God. He had it. I don't know who else had it. Yeah. Would anybody, has anybody since then achieved? Funny enough, it is analogous to uh, Amadeus. God had picked Mozart to <laughs> speak through his music. Yeah. And he had picked Michelangelo to speak through his sculptures wow. in his painting. Hey everyone, it's Arsalan. I hope you're enjoying this episode. If you are, remember to subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you can get notified every time there's a new video on the channel. Enjoy part two. What you just said is a good segue into talking about Mozart and, mm -hmm. and being, you know, divine intervention, as, as, as I said in the thing, but you also are an appreciator and lover of classical music and opera yeah. and music in general. So let's, let's, and I want to segue also into the music that you listen to growing up and, and how music oh, okay. influences you generally in life. So I, I, I guess let's begin with Mozart and work our way okay. <laughs> to now. Okay, Mozart um, is absolutely beautiful. It's like one of those you cannot deny. Some people say Beethoven. I don't, don't think it's the same category at all. Huh. Beethoven is easy. Um, there's so, many, so much beautiful music. But you remember what Mozart did was, uh, funny enough, you should mention, I, I say Eminem is the Mozart of today. And I know what I'm talking about when I say that. Not because he's so great. He is great, but not because, you know, 
in the statue, he achieves the same way. But what Mozart did to the classical musical form is what Eminem did to hip hop mm. musical form. They kind of took the existing structure and ran rings around it. Mm. They both did. And it's astounding, literally astounding. You know, as the fellow said. It's, um, so it, it's, you know, there's, again, it, it's different categories of this. You know, most of it's in the realm of the gods, you know, the realm of the divine. Uh, very few other people, great musicians, don't quite reach that. You know, it's uh, like I don't. I don't think like you know Bach does it. Does it? I don't think Beethoven does it. I don't think, you know, oh, another person that clearly does it even surpasses it. Wagner. Mm. There is no explanation for Wagner. You know, what he does, the the way he can elevate your spirit, no other music can. Beautiful music. You want beautiful music? Verdi, Puccini. Gorgeous, beautiful, magnificent, Chopin. But uh, with Wagner, it's, it, it is almost like the Sistine Chapel. Mm. It's a divine intervention thing. And as is Mozart, Mozart for that person. But the Brahms is not. <laughs> you know, she's, uh, I don't know, Mendelssohn, she's uh, Strauss, whatever. They're great musicians. Tchaikovsky comes close, beautiful musician, magnificent melody. It's really moving, but it's not godlike. Uh, beautiful, though. I do love Tchaikovsky. <laughs> uh. It's amazing how, how many recognizable melodies come from Tchaikovsky. I do. Especially the Nutcracker and Sleeping uh, Beauty. Uh, uh, Sleeping Beauty the and, black, and the Black Swan. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> And then in the end, when it sort of resolves it in my in major key, <laughs> but then sliding into into more contemporary music. You know, I haven't really. You asked me what I used to listen to when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I used to spend hours with an earphone, with a record player, and we had these uh, tapes. This. Real tapes, so but where that. places where in, in, in Tehran, in Iran, in Tehran. We had, like we had the, uh, kind of an excess room. Nobody used it for anything. It was kind of called the music room. So there's like you know a bunch of records and tapes and whatever. And you see, I used to literally go there for hours, put the earphones on, and listen to uh, Dark Side of the Moon and uh, Led Zeppelin and you know uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix and this and that. And I'm talking literally hours. Yeah. And then in college, I would spend hours with my roommate Frank listening to Jethro Tull, and Sick as a Brick, and Passion Play, and you know, analyze every chord change, every modulation, and you know, every piece of the, uh, the uh, uh, libretto, I guess, you know, the, the lyrics. Ever since records went out, I haven't really been listening to music. Hmm. I liked the fact that records were tangible. For one thing, it was an event. A new album by whoever, the Eagles or something, that would come out. Billboards all over, especially Sunset Strip. Giant billboards or whatever. So you know it's like you know, the new thing. Everybody would line up to get the new, you know, whatever, Eagles or, you know, uh, the, the Rod Stewart or David Bowie, you know. Thing. And uh, now, once they changed to first to CDs and then to DVDs and whatever, it kind of lost its, it's like cinemas, you know, when, when the premiere of, uh, you know, Gone with the Wind was, it was an international event. But now it's available on Netflix. So what? That, that kind of, you know, took the shine away from uh, music for me. And really, and I don't like the, I don't like downloading music, hate it. But I, mean, I like tactile things in general. With the thing, you take the thing, you take it off the sleeve, you put it on this, this round table, and it goes around, and you take, physically take the needle and put it on the first groove, and you sit back and listen to it. And today, you have to kind of download it, and say, okay, stop playing, but you have to subscribe if you want to continue. It's just kind of, it's, it's not an experience anymore. Right. And another problem I have is uh, today, 
with rap music, uh, I generally like rap music, even though, like everything else, there's a lot of crap around, along with the, a lot of the masterpieces. But it is something that you have to listen to the lyrics. I have a literally a physiological problem with that. Mm. I don't remember lyrics. I cannot retain lyrics. Mm. So I'm at a disadvantage. You know, the music is not that great. There's no melody. The beat is, you know, kind of whatever, random. So I'm kind of lost with rap. I generally like it. I love Eminem, for example. I love uh, Dr. Dre. But uh, I'm kind of get lost in this. So I kind of put music aside. Hmm. And then you, know, like you go to clubs and this and that. I like music that makes you, want, makes you dance. If you cannot dance, if it doesn't kind of shake the hips, What's the point of it? <laughs> you know, why play it in a club? You know, yeah. well, so well, I'm, being, I'm, I'm, I'm exposing myself as a child of disco. I was gonna say that's a great yeah. segue into into sharing whatever you can about your the heyday of your disco yeah. partying days in New York City in yeah. the late seventies. My seventies, yeah, and in LA, yeah, yeah. Studio Fifty Four with. Yeah, maybe disco has uh, gotten a bad rap. For one thing, I discard and I eliminate and I don't like and I reject any music that has the word boogie or dance. Okay. <laughs> and the beat, <laughs> don't like that. What I like is thumping music. <laughs> in a huge place where right. everybody's dancing and the spotlight is on the dance floor and it changes color and it changes the mood and it's like everybody's like, it's inclusive it's like you are participating in it as opposed to today's EDM things where the spotlight is on the DJ which has pre-recorded something and you know usually with a big mask on or whatever it's some <laughs> you know whatever uh, mascot thing Plays the music that somebody else has made, and it would go, oh, hey, DJ, hey, DJ. It doesn't make sense to me. Hmm. I used to be the one in the middle of the floor, dancing and sweating, like completely crazy, completely wet, until like four, five, six in the morning. And um, I felt like this place belonged to me and everybody else who was dancing next to me. Hmm. Now, I feel like this place belongs to the DJ and I should admire and worship the DJ by hailing him and you know, there's nothing that I can do other than admire the DJ. Right. I don't get it again. It's a pity that this kind of experience is gone. Nobody dances anymore. Nobody does. And sometimes it's a good thing that they don't dance. Hmm. You know Dobstep? I do. You know why it was made? No. Dobstep was created for white folks, especially the white guys, who have no rhythm. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense. So why should I go into a club, presumably with a dance floor and a large space and lights and music and action or whatever, and not be able to dance to a music that is not made for dancing right. by people other than white boys? So, so set the scene for what is like the apex of the disco dancing Song, club, setting, city. Well, the ultimate time, is uh, the, the ultimate is uh, Studio Fifty Four. But my favorite was this after hours club in LA called the Odyssey Two. A lot of young people in our great music, and like, is it Enrique Morador or George Giorgio Morador? Giorgio Morador, sad music, <laughs> and then early, she's uh, obviously. Before it became to disco, uh, he he kind of started the career of of the Donna Summer, mm -hmm. and then along with it came in uh, uh, the Village People, and some of the earlier stuff was really cool, you know, heavy beat. You see, before y, y M C A came out, yeah, you know, there's a, there's a something after San Francisco. It's the same kind of musical structure as Y M C A, but it's in minor key. It's that that was high high energy. Yeah. And when you're in the place, and you know it was just large and vast and you know spectacular and it was decadent and you know it was like 
indulgent and everything. And you could indulge. Mm. I, for one thing, would dance all night. Or you know, some would, you know, smoke whatever, snort coke all night. Some would drop, you know, whatever, Vicodin, you know, it was, it was back then, Quaalude all night. To each his own. Some people would have sex in the, in the balcony. To each his own. But it was an incredible feel, feeling of freedom and empowerment. Mm. In the late it 70s. Was in the, it, basically, the whole disco era represented that. You could go there and be completely indulgent in whatever it was that turned you on, completely decadent, and get away with it. And it was legitimate that everybody did so pretty much every day of the week. And uh, it, it was the ultimate in expression. Mm. You know, you express your mood, you express your desires, you express your passion, you express your lust, you express your, you know, every sensation that you should not have been able to express. You would be able to do it in a discotheque. And then it kind of changed. Saturday Night Live put a different... Saturday Night Im- Fever. Fever. Right? Put a different uh, image to disco. Yeah. You know, like this. It's, I've never been to a discotheque like that, ever. Mm-hmm. I've never even seen one. Um, <laughs> So it's kind of a pity. Uh, in Europe, it's continued. The EDM music, eventually house music, industrial music, whatever, in Europe, it is pretty much the same. In Europe, they had some incredible discotheques. Uh, there was Privilege and uh, the, the Palace in Paris. There was, um, it's, um, they still have happening discotheques. But even now, it's, uh, you don't just go in. You have to get a table for 10,000 euros in Europe or $2,000 in this tiny little place in New York these days. And it wasn't about that. You were allowed to get away in the studio before you not, except for me, get, be able to get in each time or and, and at any given time. But it was basically, you know, it wasn't based on elitism. It wasn't based on, you know, how much money you had. It's based on, you know, how cool you looked that night. Yeah. If so, you didn't look cool, they didn't get in. So what, what can you share about how, how, does one, how could one get into Studio 54? What would it take? I don't know. Back then I was like 22, 23. And then stretching into 27. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I honestly never, never had any problem getting in. But the thing is, I, never, I always went by myself. Mm. That was always my style. And never went with a group to a discotheque. Even I told you, your mama would always go to Club A. It was another fancy discotheque in the 80s. <laughs> and um, we would go, they always would go, go and get a table and you know, order champagne or whatever, and just sit down and you know, drink like this. And I always tell them, I'll meet you there. Mm-hmm. And I'd go there and I'd get a drink from the bar and sit down and say, hello, if I got tired, I'll go sit in the area, you know other people in the club too. So I'd go sit with somebody else, I'd go down with myself, and I'd put my drink down and go, oh, if they wanted to go, I didn't have to go with them. I could stay longer. I like the, you know, to be free. So, because I didn't carry any weight, you know, I didn't have any problem getting into Studio 54. Because I was young, I had hair, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that, that era, I know that you, you at least, at least two, but I, I know that there's more in terms of, pop culture music figures that were big inspirations or influences on your life. One was Donna Summer, who you talked about. Uh, I enjoyed the, her music. She's very, very talented. Yeah. Uh, but the other is David Bowie, I was going to talk oh, about. Oh, I love David Bowie. He's the ultimate in creativity. Yeah. So He's so, just a creative soul. Whatever he does, he's... Do you remember when you got introduced to David Bowie or when you sort of Oh, registered? way, way back in the early 70s when yeah. it first came out. Yeah, Ziggy Stardust. And what was the sensation like? Maybe it wasn't, a, it wasn't a drastic sensation. He's not a drastically different artist. Um, he sort of came in at the wake of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. And then there was, you know, the third, you know, British artist was uh, David Bowie. And his music is not radical in any way. But it's very subtle. What I like about his music is the melody changes. Mm-hmm. Every song has four different songs in it. Mm-hmm. And that's a gift. And that, very few people recognize that about him. Mm. And then his persona, his, uh, you know, kind of, you know, his, his, uh, like Mick Jagger is always Mick Jagger. Mm-hmm. And the Beatles, you know, the, you know, except when they became a Maharishi thing with a long beard or whatever, were always the Beatles, you know, the, that the kind of short with the bangy hair with dark, with a skinny tie and dark suit. And then they evolved into this robes and you know, big 
It's kind of a hippie looking thing. Sign of the times, it's a perfectly valid, whatever. But David Bowie sort of took it much further than anybody else in that era had. He kind of introduced misogyny. Androgyny. Androgyny. You're right, they're not <laughs> misogyny, no, androgyny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, it was radical. His image, his persona was radical. Right. His music was much more subtle than his persona. Mm. So, so I was like, musically, my favorite was Jethro Tull, yeah. by far. Incredible musician. Right. Uh, very rich, mus musically rich and complex, complex and, you know, multifaceted. But, uh, like, for example, I love Linda Ronstadt, believe it or not. Mm. I love Rod Stewart. I didn't really like the Eagles, even though that probably defines my era better, better, better than anything else. The Eagles. The, the, yeah, well, Hotel California. Like, it's another tequila sunrise. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of, back, back to Donna Summer for a quick second, because I know that you want to talk about this topic, what you famously said in the past um, on the subject of tattoos. Oh, God. That Donna Summer is is the example that you cite, where yeah, uh, where where back in the day, if you were to have gotten a tattoo when you were younger, you yeah, would have I'd gotten... have to live with Donna Summer's portrait right here, yeah, <laughs> because I made that decision forty years ago. <laughs> it's, so, it's exactly... and you, and you would not you would not be happy with that. You 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 tell tell, tell that us would be tell us yeah tell tell us about your it your would thoughts. Be disgraced, on yeah. Tattoos is like sin. Mm. It is worse than abomination. Abomination is like eating shrimp. It'll be out of you in a few hours. Sin, you live forever. You kill somebody, whether you feel guilty or not, the culpability is yours forever. Mm. So that's like tattoos. Stays with you forever. And me, for, for personally and subjectively, I'm Aquarius, so I don't like commitments. I don't like to commit to this shirt or these pants or anything that's stacked on me forever. I may like it now, I may toss it away, you know, change to something else tomorrow. What, how would you feel if you bought a Nike sneakers in 2002 when they first came out and they were crazy glued on your feet <laughs> since then? You'd have to shower with it, you'd have to sleep with it, you'd walk with it, but you couldn't get it off. Right. That's like what tattoos and people don't realize that the permanency of tattoos. Plus then, the idea of getting tattooed, the mind process of getting tattooed, is relatively simple. It doesn't take much sophistication to A, decide to get a tattoo, and then decide how to, what kind of a tattoo and where to get. Those are basically two processes in getting a tattoo. First one, very simple, even less developed brains can do that. Sheep do it all the time. Decide to follow other sheep. Every day, sheep are following other sheep. Like tattoos, that putting on a tattoo because somebody else has a tattoo. It is the same mental neurological process. Now, that is fashion. And it's great for fashion houses. They love to have people that are coming to. So it's, imagine you, you, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of sheep. And there's, you know, kind of different, you know, little, you know, hills and, you know, whatever, pairs and stuff like that. And then, okay, come to my, I am Nike, come to my field and I'm very nice, you know, whatever, I got a really nice logo, whatever. So everybody follows it. And then there's, I did, oh, no, 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 wait a minute, come to over to mine and all the soccer players play. So some of the sheep go there. And then Louboutin say, oh, come to me, come to me. I'm very, very chic, très, très chic, but very uncomfortable. So they go to Louboutin. And then, you know, Croc said, I'm really, really ugly, but I'm comfortable. So you Crocs. can go Crocs. What did I say? <laughs> that's like Crocs, yeah, that's okay, like... yeah. So it's like you can pick and choose. You can move around. And then there's tattoos that come over to this crevice and you fall and you never to get better to get back up. And, it, and the sheep follow. They can never come back up. It's a myth that you can get the laser thing, you can remove it. No, you can't. A trace of it will always remain. Mm. So... This is a short-sightedness on the people who get tattoos who think and believe that this is a fashion that will last forever or it is their taste that will not change ever. It's wrong. Then there's a question of what kind of a tattoo to get where. Mm -hmm. 
those who have the means and know a great tattoo artist and great tattoo artists are you know very very great artists there's great artistry in the work of the tattoo not in the wearing of the tattoo you so they have the whole side you know or like this beautiful beautiful skin. I saw this guy incredible painting one another guy had a, this bartender somewhere had this um Zeus and Poseidon, <laughs> whatever, beautiful, beautiful artwork. So, what does that make you? Mm. The tattoo artist is a great artist. What does that make you? Either a canvas or a gallery wall. So, your self-impression, self-worth, self-respect is no better than I am a canvas. Then there's people who put random tattoos all over the place, have nothing to do with each other, you know, whatever. Uh, anchor here, you know, a leg here, you know, a rose here, whatever. Those are like uh, items I have in the closet. I have Nike shoes in there, and I have this, uh, you know, some Hollister shirt over there, and a pair of, you know, whatever, jeans over there, and, you know, these random things in the closet. So the tattoos are like the items in the closet. Mm. So their self-respect is, I am nothing but a closet. Then there's ones that try to convince you that they are unique and they're special and whatever. Oh, this is not. This is like not a uh, a, a pie. This is my grandmother's pie, and I put it in because uh, my grandmother used to make pie like this and whatever. Well, did she die? No, but she moved to a place that doesn't have a good oven. You know, it's a uh, it's a random, personally selected thing. Oh, I'm not a follower of fashion. Look, that sheep stepped on this rock, yeah. I'm stepping on the side of the rock. Okay. These people who are like meaningful little things all over their body are like scrapbooks. So their self-image, their self-respect is that they know better than a scrapbook. Hmm. So people who have tattoos are either a canvas or a closet or a scrapbook. Hmm. And I should have respect for them. Well, my question is, would you ever find yourself curious enough to try no. what it feels like to have a tattoo? No. Th this Would you find yourself curious enough to poke a hole into your balls? <laughs> Not yet. Okay, so 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 then what then using using your radical compassion or radical imagination, what there obviously is appeal, not just not just do you uh, know that in the world there are far more sinners than there are do-gooders but in terms of same as tattoos so so do you think so you think you, th you think the sex appeal of tattoos for example is connected to the sex appeal of of hard drugs and no, other sinful no, things or what no no hard drugs are a lot better than tattoos because you can stop or you can take whenever you want to most right. people can't stop tattoos you can you can undo tattoos right and the, the, even if you can undo tattoos, it is the mentality. Three billion people in the world have tattoos. So what does that make you? Original? Mm. Unique? Do you think there are, well, what, are there degrees of acceptability no. of tattoos? No, 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 no. A little tattoo is like being a little pregnant by an unknown father. Bad idea. <laughs> okay. But, but, I, mean, but of course, I, but of I course, look but, at but, tattoos. But, but but of course, what about what about you know, ancient or tribal cultures where tattoo is a part of? Their... I mean, that was their tradition. Yes, they had different tattoos, like uh, they had different army uniforms for different countries' armies yeah. to distinguish them. Napoleon had blue or red, and the Duke of Wellington had blue uniforms. The Maori tribes in this particular island had, you know, this kind of a tattoo, but then the, another Maori Polynesian warriors in another island had this kind of a tattoo to distinguish them when they had wars against you. Do we have wars with random people here around you? This guy walking by here, 45 years old, has tattoos all over his foot, his leg, his arm, his chest, sometimes his neck, sometimes it's his face. You, are you at war with him because you only have tattoos here and then at the big one here? Mm. It doesn't make sense. That doesn't translate. We don't live in a Maori island. Well, in, the, in, 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 in gang communities or, or, or some tribal communities around the world, there is. Are, are you, uh, so I does that mean that's the thing? 
<coughs> used to be like a, whatever, sailors had tattoos and prisoners had tattoos. So it's identified with that. But now it's so pervasive, everybody has a tattoo. Yeah. The fashion, this guy, uh, was whatever, what's his name? Um, mm, designer, he designs handbags. Uh, Jacob, Mark Jacobs. Jake, Mark Jacobs. He's covered with tattoos. The German aristocrats have tattoos. Everybody has tattoos, so there's no distinction between these. If it's a young person having tattoos, or old people having tattoos, there's an the entire range. Predominantly younger people have tattoos, but it goes all over, so you're not even distinguishing as, as a generational expression. Hmm. That is null and void. Wow. So, I look at people with tattoos and say, forgive them, Lord, for doing not, not what they do. And, and do, you, do you imagine it's going to get more and more uh, popular and pervasive? As the no, generation? as a matter of fact, the opposite. I think people are going to get suddenly sick of it. And what I want to do is come up with an ointment that you rub on it and it comes off without any trace. And I'm waiting for God to give me the power to do that. Wow. And I'd be a billionaire. Yeah. It's, it's a mistake. And people are going to cut on to the fact that it was a mistake. Tattoos. Yeah. I already hear this friend of mine has tattoos all over the, her place, all over, all over the place. And she was telling me, she, everybody knows that I hate tattoos. She was telling me, you know, kind of sheepishly, I like some of my tattoos, but you're right. Some of them I want to change. I want to take off. I kind of regret having had them. So, and I hear that from a lot more people than I did five years ago, ten years ago. Okay. I guess we'll, 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 we'll track that. Yeah. Wait until I come up with my pomade. <laughs> that would erase tattoos forever. I should yeah. be made a saint. I should be canonized. Well, you you you're already embarking on a new venture, which is getting into into fashion and writing a book. Yeah. So you're 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 trying your hand at a lot of different things. So maybe maybe that's I, the I, next I, I, I love the idea. I don't know if it's called creativity, but I love the idea of sort of come up with an idea. And sketch it out, you know, literally in the back of a napkin or whatever, a piece of an envelope, and then see it through, see it, it uh, realize. Painting certainly does that. Books writing certainly does that. Fashion is kind of fun, but it's like yeah. you're not that serious an expression of that. That it, it's not a need. Yeah. yeah. Well, writing we, is, painting certainly is. Before we, before we end, definitely tell us about about your books and how it's how it's been going, and tell us about Persian Wars. Uh, well, I really enjoyed writing them, uh, and I really enjoy when people, those who have read it and liked it, and call me and say that they really liked it and they really enjoyed it, and you know whatever that is, whatever is very fluid. With it. I really enjoy that. It's a wonderful feeling. I told you, and I really as I told you, this art. You know that being in a perform in performance art. I remember coming to your place, your, 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 and, and I'd be backstage, like I'd hover around backstage. And when the kids would come out, ah, oh, the audience is so great tonight. Mm -hmm. So that to me is uh, translated into this performance is not you projecting, it is you interacting with the audience. In theater, especially. In theater, very much so. But in all sort of artistic end of it is the same thing but in a different way painting I love the fact that some, when some people like, like my paintings I love the fact that when people question me about a painting when people see something in a painting that I haven't noticed or didn't intend it or whatever it's, like, it's an interaction and with a book when people like it it's uh, I managed I, I succeeded in getting my message Mm. I was a good communicator. And when they like it, it's uh, an interaction, my communication and their appreciation. That kind of, that synergy is very, very gratifying. Great. Yeah, and, and, and then I guess maybe in fashion, it's, it's people wearing Fashion clothes. is fun. <laughs> fashion is like these nails. But yeah. You know, they do it once in a while. Oh, uh, 
I don't. I don't think I, uh, fashion will ever be something that you know is, is a need that I need to express myself through. Yeah, I'm not. A. I don't do fashion anyway. I do style. B. It is just not that important, and a message is not important. A creation. I could. I'm thinking of like you know fancier pants and regular jeans. I'm so sick of. Go to go to my closet. It's like you know I have you know thirteen gray jeans and four blue jeans and five black jeans, and I do have a pink jean and a red jean and a green jean and a white jean. That's it. They're all the same thing. Yeah. So it's kind of, you know, for variety, I tried to, I bought the fabrics to sort of make colorful pants and things like colorful jeans. Really. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to translate into a fashion line. I certainly don't want to, don't think in terms of, you know, having it a business. But I think I, I will wear it and I'll be having fun wearing it. And hopefully, you know, we'll see whether it becomes an yeah. interaction or not. But that's not my, that's not a, a need in me. I told you before, uh, painting or any creative process that you're serious about is a need, is a hunger. You have to do it. Your body, your being, your soul needs it. Fashion is not a need. Mm. It's fun. And, it's and like cooking. It's like, as a need, and you also said that art is communication, primarily. Art is communication, I told you, yeah. yeah. You have to, it's an interaction between the auteur and the viewer and the, and the audience. Great. Well, that's, that's uh, <laughs> the episode. Well, thank, thanks for sharing all of that, and, sure. and, and we'll catch up more and next And then some. <laughs> exactly. Well, thanks, Dad. Oh, and, better. and it's great talking to you and visiting you, as always. So I come back. I'll come back and do more. <laughs> yeah, for, for you, all your audiences, this guy hates me. He'll never come back here again. <laughs> That's not Unless true. there's another alternative reason for it. An ulterior motive? An ulterior motive. Yeah. That's right. All right. Well, we yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>